know that chemotherapy, cisplatin, all can have vestibulotoxic effect. So while the individual may have survived their cancer, they're now left with a bilateral vestibular dysfunction. Rehabilitation is going to be more challenging because they're not like a unilateral acquired. You cannot compensate to a BVD like you do with a unilateral. Also, let's look at some other comorbidities. Diabetes right now is almost epidemic. Hypertension, rheumatic disorders, autoimmune, neurological conditions, multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's disease. Patients with MS and Parkinson's are now actually living normal lifespans. So they've got more complication as well. So we have to be aware that when we're dealing with our older adult patients, they're not just an ear. The literature is very, very clear on the impact of everything from vitamin D deficiencies, vestibular toxicity, psoriatic arthritis, um, diabetes mellitus, and the impact on this. Uh, you can go to dizzy.com. We have open access. It's free. You can watch dozens of video case studies and download videos uh, of patients, but also you can download free of charge all of our scientific articles and all of my textbook chapters. Uh, so you have an unlimited resource uh, to, to read more about these conditions. So what we need to decide as diagnosticians is what tests are we going to utilize that are going to give us the best overall look at what the patient's disabilities are, okay? So at some point, we're beyond the point of a medical diagnosis. So if a person has end-stage Meniere's disease, if they had a vestibular neuritis, if they have BPPV, once the medical diagnosis is made through any array of diagnostic protocols that are available to us, we now have to make the decision, okay, now what? The patient is not going to ever be satisfied with the fact that you're able to say to them, well, Mrs. Patel, you've obviously got a multifactorial disequilibrium due to diabetic retinopathy, microvascular disease of the vestibular nuclei, peripheral neuropathy. What does the patient say? Help me, help me. I, I'm only 68 years old. I wanna live my life. What do I do? So the medical diagnosis is wonderful and we can pat ourselves on the back, but the patient's not happy with that. The patient wants help. The other issue is that depending on the facility you're in, you may not have every test available. So you're going to need to understand within your own clinics, within your own laboratories, what complaints that the patient is presenting that is going to give you the most help. So for example, if a patient said, well, you know, it's crazy, but if I walk quickly and I turn my head and I look at things, I feel like the world is bouncing up and down. I know, let's do caloric testing. Well, the patient is complaining of oscillopsia. So unless you're gonna do a dynamic visual acuity test, you may not actually see a manifestation of the patient's complaints. And this is where we begin to cross into the world of rehabilitation. And how do we work 
with our colleagues in physical medicine, physiatry, physical therapy, occupational therapy, or in many cases, audio vestibular physicians, audiologists, ENTs, will actually do the work ourselves. And we can do many, many things. We certainly can treat BPPV. We can give patients self-directed home exercise programs so long as it's safe for them to do it. If we're fortunate enough to have virtual reality in our clinics, as we do at the Institute, this is a wonderful new technology. But when do we need to understand that the physical therapist and the physiatrist is going to have to get involved? Now, why? Because these patients may not be patients that can compensate because they have a bilateral vestibular dysfunction. So habituation isn't going to work, right? We've got to use substitution. What about full risk? What about other type of activities? So we need to understand the patient's history. We need to take a good history to understand everything that's going on with them. And what are they really complaining about? Is it a dizziness? Is it vertigo? Or just general imbalance? These are things the physio needs to understand to best determine what type of therapy that they're going to engage for the patient. We know that if they have an impaired VOR, they're going to have an issue with a relationship between head movement and eye movement. So they'll tell you they have a feeling of blurred vision. They have difficulty focusing. They turn their head at a particular speed and things are no longer clear to them. These are kind of classic manifestations of a VOR impairment. VSR tends to be more, I don't feel sure-footed. I feel like I have to hold on. I feel like I have to touch things. So the physical therapist needs to understand all these different symptoms that the patient is experiencing. Let's be realistic. An abnormal V head or an abnormal caloric or an abnormal rotary chair does not tell you what therapy to do. There is no known therapy for 46% right caloric weakness. Function, function, function. We have to understand the functional impairment of the patient. And we have to understand that the patient's prognosis and what might be real objectives might be affected by other medical comorbidities. So we may have to modify our best intentions, our goals and our objectives and our strategies to match these, these other medical conditions. So the physical therapist, after we provide rotary chair, posturography, VHIT, OVEMP, CVEMP, the physical therapist has to get a picture, a gestalt of the overview of the patient's musculoskeletal system, of their balance ability, of their ability to ambulate, so that they can begin to develop a meaningful rehabilitation or balance retraining program. If you try to do therapy the same for everybody, it simply won't work. You won't produce great outcomes, right? So we need to understand if it's BPPV, which ear, which canals. If it's an uncompensated unilateral, right? Right ear, left ear, what are their abnormal findings? And if it's a BVD, bilateral, what are their problems as well? We have to also understand that the brain can't fix 
what the brain can't see. So we prefer to work with a patient that is uncompensated, but that is not having acute debilitating attacks of vertigo. And this we refer to as a stabilized condition. Uncompensated simply means that they continue to be symptomatic even after the acute debilitating attacks are gone. What we also need to remember that compensation works more like a dimmer switch and not like a big on and off switch. So that by the time the patient has come to us, they are already partially compensated. Our goal will be to find out where the non-compensated areas exist so that we don't waste time. So we know what these symptoms are and we're gonna move forward with questioning and some of the assessments. So what are our goals? Here in the United States, when we develop uh, goals for patients in therapy, they have to be specific. Right? So a goal in the area of ambulation might be the patient will be able to walk. The patient will be able to keep their center of gravity. The patient will be able to reach for an object in their cabinet and maintain their balance. They'll be able to transfer, get on and off the toilet, get in and out of bed. These are all very important real world goals. Activities of daily living. Can the person take care of themselves? Can they walk from their bedroom to the bathroom, right? Can they prepare a simple meal in their kitchen? And then we have measurements like dynamic gait index, timed up and go, so we can actually demonstrate the improvement in their function after we put them in therapy. So from this, we will develop a plan of care based specifically on the unique needs of the patient. Every patient is an N of one, and that's very critical that we remember that. So from our smorgasbord, if you will, of all the different things that we can utilize with this patient, we're going to create a unique plan of care for them. So if you look at this table, we can talk about the symptom types. We can talk about the clinical findings diagnostically. We can put a name to the condition. We can talk about the treatment. And then of course, we can look at what their outcomes are going to be. So producing outcomes for us has to be measurable. So as we define vestibular rehabilitation, we want to make sure that we are improving or restoring everyday activities, whether we're using adaptation, habituation, or substitution. Now, the American Physical Therapy Association has some very specific guidelines that are simply recommendations about what you should do with patients with a unilateral condition versus a bilateral condition and the nature of their therapy. We also have recommendations versus dizziness or vertigo using hab habituation and balance or falls, balance and gait therapy, or poor endurance, walking or aerobic activity. So these are meant to be guidelines. And again, patients are an N of one. So these are global guidelines, but they act as a good starting point. Again, if the patient has oscillopsia, we're going to focus on gaze stabilization. If they have problem with visual vestibular integration, then we're going to do habituation, optokinetics, virtual reality, visual conflict, and if they have vestibular recruitment, we will focus more on habituation. 
If it is a balanced dysfunction, dynamic surfaces, multiplane stimulation, perturbations, 